Okay, welcome back, world. We are at episode three for Smash Course, bringing you all the collegiate and pro level Smash action right in a half an hour time frame. Great feedback so far. Thank you for watching. We're back with Hungrybox, Max, Joe, and myself to just keep the conversation going. How's it going, guys? It's going well. Good, good. Chilling. How's it going, guys? Having some technical difficulties with my <laughs> webcam. I'm not sure why, but. Uh, I can I can lot. see it now, Max. I accepted your video, and your beautiful ba face appeared on my screen. So now now it's all good for me, at least. So all I can right, see yeah, it. You're good, man. You got Sweet. a new haircut. It's dope. It looks great. Shout out to haircuts. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. Yeah, both of us. Yeah, apparently, <laughs> yes. You too, Hungerbox. You look great. So yeah, thank you. I, I I my haircut will be next week. I will wait one more week for that. No so worries. we will. Kind of just kick it off real quick with uh, some collegiate wrap-up. Texas, New England happened last week, and, uh, you know, it was pretty pretty hype. Uh, I think for Melee at in New England especially, was uh, there were a lot of teams in there because I know Tyler, our writer, was there, and he was there for hours. He said it was, uh, it was some good action. So how about uh, you guys tell us what happened? Uh, give us a bit of a roundup. So I will start with the New England qualifier for Melee. So... We had Brandeis University. I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing that right. Brandeis. Brandeis. Brandeis, Brandeis. Yeah. yeah. They, uh, they took it home. And then for Smash 4, we had Roger Williams. Uh, something that I wanted to note was for the singles bracket of Smash 4, Kool-Aid actually took that. Uh, Kool-Aid has a deep history in the competitive scene. Me and Max know him really well. Good mm -hmm. friend of ours. Uh, so it was really cool to see a professional level player come through for uh, the collegiate event and represent. Um, so, once again, big shout-outs to Kool-Aid. And also, um, you know, round of applause to New England Melee. I think we had 10 teams out um, this past weekend. Uh, new yep. record for the season so far. So, amazing job. Uh, just goes to show, you know, the foundations that Matt has laid out um, for us, who was on last week talking about the history of TMG. So, yeah, uh, big shout-outs to New England Melee. And uh, I'm excited to see uh, what the second qualifier for New England brings as well. Yeah, of course, that is only the New England South portion, right? So like Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. And then we've got in early November, or like toward mid-November, we have the New England North qualifier in New Hampshire. So Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine will be going out to that. So there are definitely more schools in that pocket. I mean, that's, of course, like the most saturated area for colleges just in the entire country, I believe. Yep. Pretty crazy that Matt has built something where uh, he has two qualifiers from his own region, so... Right, That's right. Crazy. All right, and then over in Texas, uh, the Texas A&M University team took home Melee. Um, they actually, as we did a wrap-up with their TO earlier today, we were informed that they were DQ'd into losers first round because they hit some traffic or it just it took longer for them to get there than expected. So they actually played the entire tournament from the losers bracket. So not only do they have to win two sets of grand finals, but they had to play more sets than anybody else because, of course, in double elimination brackets, it's always faster on your path to victory from the winner's bracket. You play less rounds out. So congratulations to Texas A&M for taking first there. And then University of Houston won Smash 4. Their road was not nearly as crazy, but I believe there also was... Oh, no, I'm sorry. There was no bracket reset for Smash 4. But either way, uh, Texas was full of dark horse players. We, we did like a full wrap-up with Puyon from uh, Oklahoma University. He was our TO second time in a row, uh, and he also has run for TMG as well. So uh, he filled us in on a whole bunch of details, like a bunch of rising star players for both games showed up. And then also some players that you would expect on the melee side, this guy Albert, who was uh, second on like the last statewide Texas power ranking. And of course, Texas is huge. So that's like a huge uh, accomplishment. He uh, got first place in singles, I believe. And um, yeah, he... He did a really good job in Cruz as well with his Falco. That's crazy. I think um, I'm interested in hearing like what other maybe data you're pulling from these events because I know you're getting scorecards in and stuff. Is there anything interesting, any trends popping up that you've noticed? Uh, you know, it's like almost week three now, right? So, Right. We'll get back to you on that when <laughs> we get the scorecards. It's, okay. You know, yeah. We're still waiting on the TOs to send them back to us. But Come on, guys. We'll, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. We'll... We'll have more data hopefully right. next week. Yeah, this is the the second week of qualifiers just wrapped up, but also week one was only one individual event rather than two. 
So uh, week one and a half has passed, let's put it that way. All right. Well, we're gearing up real fast, and that, that sounds good. I feel like, um, you know, we're, we're off to a good start. Um, but it's not just, you know, for, for me, it's exciting to just see who's coming out of these, and I want to get more faces and names out there. So, you know, when you get that data in, we'll, we'll chat on it. But we can kind of, like, transition to our next topic, which is going straight into the summit, because we were watching the voting right before we started filming. So I know we're all super hyped on that last vote. So I'm going to kind of, like, field it out there. How are you guys feeling about, you know, what's happening um, in terms of the hype? Obviously, this is one of the community-oriented uh, events, sort of like what I'm used to from StarCraft, which is Home Story Cup, and I know that th that was an inspiration for this. So I'm excited to hear, obviously, from Hungrybox, who is an invited player, but for you guys as part of the community, um, what you think this fifth summit is going to bring and this crazy prize pool, was it 26000 for first place, the prize pool is seventy four thousand. Yeah. Oh my, God. that's crazy. Seventy five thousand right now. How much is looking at right now? Um, look, Smash Summit Five. Um, obviously, this year especially, it, it raised a lot of controversy actually because people people were like actually concerned about you know is this fair for a lot of players getting in? But you know, to be honest, I give props to be on the summit for being like the first organization to actually do the idea of a compendium properly and use a web app as sophisticated as Smash.gg, where you can see live voting and see individual votes plocking in like drops in a bucket. It just makes it all a very like it's like a game show almost, and mm -hmm. it's extremely mm -hmm. fascinating and entertaining for anyone to be involved in. You all get votes even for like sharing tweets, for buying merchandise. You put them in. And you get your favorite players in on a, on a good chance. Um, you know, I always say do not blame the Summit for this. Blame the people who are putting in that much money for the favorite players to go. You know, if you have a problem, gripe it with them, not the people who are smart enough to come up with a, a brilliant business scheme that also provides one of the best tournament series of all time in Smash. So I think people need to get the priorities straight. But, um, you know, the lineup this year, uh, obviously I'm very happy to be voted in. Armada voted in. Uh, Mango, Mewtwo King, Leffen, Plup. Uh, and then we have Axe and Sfat, where this eight eight invited in, and the players who made it in based upon winning were Wizrobe and Shroom, two very good players, arguably top ten for each of them. And then so they deserved it, in, they deserved it in as well. And the six players who made it in were Crush, who had the New England backing. You had Amsa today, who broke the record at, at 120,000 votes. That's forty five thousand dollars put in Jesus dollars Christ. just to get Amsa in the summit. By people around the world, um, you had uh, you had hacks who had all of New York's backing, and he had a very good uh, social media campaign going. So he did a very good job with that too. Then you had Mike Hayes, who was very clever, also organized all the SoCal people, all his fans at the right time, put in you know not as neat, almost half as much as went into Amsa, but still made it in. And the last two, of course, were uh, Blay Agello, who if he made it in, goes to show anyone can make it in. I think. Blaise he was ranked in 2015, wasn't ranked this year, but he's got a great personality, got a great heart. He's a Luigi player from South Florida, and he's not as on the map as nearly half the players who opted in, but he still made it in because he knew the right people to talk to, and he knew how to organize things. So I give props to him. I'm never surprised he made it in, but I'm very happy. Um, and finally, who's the last one? Who am I missing? Um, just a mic. Crush. Blaise. Hacks. Crush was, I think, who you, who you were missing. There's six. No, right? he sent him, yeah. Huh? S2J. Oh, and S2J. Sorry, how could I forget? Johnny makes it in for his fifth consecutive summit at the last second. Um, pretty much clutched it out. So the people have spoken, and those who have the money to do so have put in the players they want to do so. Either way, summit is going to be incredible this year, and I think it's going to really open up a lot of avenues for these new players who haven't been to a summit to maybe get a sponsorship opportunity to show their personality on stream and to maybe take games or even sets off some top players. So it's always a very exhilarating experience and I'm looking I'm just ecstatic for it I think it's gonna it's also the definer I think for the final rankings this year a lot which I'm personally you know very attached to but you know at end all be all some of it is about entertainment and some it's about pushing forward the community and I think I've done that regardless of what you think yeah, like, uh, there were a lot of people that were salty at Beyond the Summit just because of how much money is being uh, put towards the event, but just I, think this, I, th I think this is more so just, you know, a testament to, you know, how top players can leverage their fan bases to help tournaments grow. Um, I think a lot of the reason why open bracket tournaments are struggling is because you don't really leverage any of the top players to help get the word out or make the event a success. It's kind of just, you know, promote the event on the TO's end or anyone on the tournament organization's end. 
uh, and then hope that people come, hope that people are hype about it. Whereas Summit kind of spins that on its head. Um, they let the players do the marketing for them, which is super smart um, because, you know, the fans of said players are more invested in the series. They want to support the players. So, um, yeah, I, I totally agree. I don't think there's any reason to be upset at Beyond the Summit for, you know, reinventing the wheel, so to speak. It's just to show that, um, you know, the traditional methods of hosting events and advertising events, um, they can be improved. And if there's ways to, you know, get these top players involved where they're directly um, marketing to the community and helping spread the word, I'm, I'm all for it. Like, uh, let's, you know, brainstorm ways to get these compendiums outside of just the summit and at our own super majors. Because if this event can raise this amount of money, there's no reason why a grassroots super major um, can't see that kind of financial success too. And I think that's something that top players and community members alike would celebrate. Like, who doesn't want to see uh, more uh, bigger prize pools? Who doesn't want to see more money put into production of the events uh, to make them successful? Um, TOs that don't go into the red hosting the events. Like, these are all things that are welcomed I think universally from people across um, the community. It's just more so how do we mobilize people so that, um, you know, they, they pour in this amount of support to other events. And that's something that I don't think anyone's figured out outside of the, the summit. The thing because, is, yeah, the thing, like, like we said, she just posted on Twitter recently that he ran in a 20K loss for Shine, which it wasn't news to me, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy that he posted it um, on Twitter right now because it goes to show you that a lot of these TOs, they really do think about this in a long-term sense. A lot of them quit their jobs. A lot of them just quit having, you know, very lucrative, you know, careers because they want to run these events and they want to, you know, be as successful as something like Evo or something like Summit. Evo has prestige. Evo has kind of like monopoly on the fighting game market. There will never be another Evo. Evo exists to be Evo, right? And it's just like there can only be one and they have it. All the other ones have their own knit, their own um, like qualities and characteristics with like unique. CEO has like sort of owns the south southern market with Florida. Edge Bailey is a very good organizer and he really is good at getting venues and events and having experiences that have make it a lot different for, from Evo, but still give you a really good just as spectator or player experience overall. And you have all the other smaller ones in terms of Smash, Big House, they kind of run the, the Midwest market and they own an October slot. Um, Summit is the only one who does compendiums properly. And Shine is trying to own the Northeast market and I believe they want to be a summer event as well. But, you know, when events like Smash and Splash happening, which are kind of like, people when they go to tournaments, if, if they're going to pay big money to go to tournaments, they want to have something that's memorable. Not like there's another tournament where they go to, they get 0 and 2, they go home, they pay $80 plus airplane fees, plus hotels. Uh, and that's what makes Summit so special, right? How is it that the, the tournament that's making the most money is the one that people aren't attending, but rather the one that people are controlling the entertainment of the tournament when they choose the players and they choose their own spectator experience that's where the money comes from it's almost as if they know they're not going to make it in they know they're not going to be at the event but they still will spend gladly not two days not three days but five days especially in some at five watching their favorite smash players just fuck around you know it's just like <laughs> it's something that really goes a long way and um no other event can really do it the same and i was just thinking it's raw here Having a collegiate summit, right? Having a thing where it's like, you know, get these collegiate players in here and see who's the best college player right now who's not a big name. That would be another idea. But it's it's entertainment. It's brand. It's wrestling yeah. in a sense. For sure. Yeah. I think you guys just made a bunch of killer observations, uh, particularly what Joe said about having the players do the marketing for the event. I think that's something that I'd like to see kind of spread out into the culture more because – like, yeah, there's a lot of incentive for the players to do that for something like Summit where they have to do that or else they won't be present, right? But these players also have to consider that if they're not putting their first foot forward or their best foot forward, rather, with marketing events and drawing people in, then their paychecks are going to dwindle over time, right? Like, they need to keep the content alive. They need to keep drawing people into the buildings because that's your prize money. That's your spectatorship, et cetera. Like, if these events aren't at the forefront of the community, you know, like people aren't seeing this and there aren't eyes on it, then you being a good player is fruitless. So uh, I do really like how Summit incentivizes people to do it individually. I would like to see them in the future, you know, just be like, oh, guys, Shine 2018 is coming up. Like, get really hyped about this, even though my spot in it is guaranteed and I don't need to actually tell people to go. Like, that's Shi Deng's job, not mine. Um, it still helps me in the long run, even in a very small way. Um, 
Uh, Collegiate Summit definitely sounds like a cool idea. And HBox, what you're saying about something memorable about the event, right? Like how Evo has kind of a, a stranglehold on like that prestigious World Finals. It's like the Vegas Super Bowl, exactly. <laughs> they, they have exactly, that. yeah. Right, CEO. It has the whole wrestling counter or uh, yeah. aspect to it, and then Smash and Splash. There's a water park there, and we're talking about Shine and the the deficit it operated at. I think Shine is like close to the pinnacle of how a Smash tournament can be run. It was oh, it's like, phenomenal. Sports, yeah, tons the merchandise of space, was great too. Amazing branding. There's so many yep. strong suits to it, but also, uh, which is going to bring us into our next topic, because they're one in the Northeast and two in August. That puts them two weeks after Smash, or I'm sorry, Super Smash Con, which has this entire other count, you know, other uh, component to it, where it's a convention as well as a tournament. So, you know, that's something for casual players to go to, and they'll get their fill whether they go own to bracket or not. There's live music, there's friendlies all over the place, tons of setups. Uh, so yeah, Shine is directly competing with that. And our next topic, tournament saturation, I think that's something that really could have hurt them. And sure, like. Even if they got all the people who went to SmashCon and more, Shine still would have operated at a pretty hefty deficit. So, you know, that's I think a different I, issue. I but think still. She, she should just work on getting... The venue he has is phenomenal, but there's no point... You can't operate a loss for two years. Right, right. Unless you make bank the third year. But if he, makes, if he, lost, if he loses money, Shine 2018 as well, you know, call it Triple Shine or whatever he wants to call it. Like, there's some clear fixes that have to be on there. You have to raise the venue fee $10 a person. You have to get a cheaper venue. And you have to just have less... There's easy fat to trim at events. Right. You can ask any successful yeah. TO. That's part of being a businessman. Just cut, take the L's. Cut the losses. And, you know, no one's going to knock out of your tournament because, A, a certain vendor isn't there. Or B, the certain, you know, the amenities weren't exactly great. People are there for the tournament and the entertainment first and foremost. That's a priority. Just make sure there's a, make sure there's a bathroom. Make sure the venue isn't in this horrible sketch part of town. <laughs> And make sure the venue is spacious enough to have people play without being, you know, sweaty or just a comfortable experience. A lot of the frills and extras, which some TOs want to use in order to make their events more inciting, that's what causes them to be in the red. And we don't want that. We want everyone yeah. to be in the black. We want everyone to continue running events. Even breaking even is a beautiful thing. Trust me. Yeah. When you're yeah. That and we're, and that, we're talking about how uh, Summit, you know, brings in the most money, even though the fewest people are going there. And all they require is literally, what, an Airbnb or however they lock down the house for five days. That's all it took. Yeah. And to be fair, I, you know, I did speak to, to she as well. And I know he has plans, like, for next year to, like, diversify, make some more, you know, uh, events happening at Shine. And I think, you know, what happens is, and I can see from experience in the CSL is each year you have a learning, you know, a curve and you take what you've learned and you extrapolate to the next year. So I feel like he has plans for next year. We'll have to, you know, let him do his masterminding. But yes, I mean, giving this feedback is so important. Um, and somebody like, you know, uh, the crew at Beyond the Summit, they have experience outside of Smash. They have worked with Dota for years, and they've seen what happens in StarCraft, and they've seen what is successful, and they've applied it to the world of Smash too. So I think like getting this feedback is valuable, and I think she and others will appreciate it for their own events. And I think also there's a key to seeing what works for other um, esports, so to speak, and you know applying it in this uh, field in a unique way. And I think that's why the summit is, is turning out to be so hyped this year, just personally yeah. from kind of like the outsider perspective. And, you know, CSL might be the spark that shine needs, right? If we're talking about specific angles and added layers that make tournaments memorable for reasons other than just, I showed up, I competed in the tournament. We're running CSL finals there next year. National finals will be at shine. So that could be a huge component. You know, shine could be like the, direct ally of the collegiate scene and that might drive a whole bunch more people to come for different reasons you know we're going to have collegiate lane brackets and stuff just like we've had the open singles brackets for students only at our local qualifiers so far you know that's definitely something that we're going to do at shine as well so uh yeah it's, it's tough in this market when everyone is looking and yeah. seeing these examples of success i want to run a tournament i want to do this too but there are only so many weekends in the year there are 52 weekends, and you know the Smash League is largely concentrated in the United States. So, Amen. with that in mind, it's super hard to actually be the next breakout tournament, especially with issues like top player burnout, right? Where particularly Leffen and Zero, I've seen the TSM boys complaining about having to fly to a different city in a different state, even though it's all within the U.S. for the most part. It's still 
takes its toll on you when you're doing this and you have to perform at your peak. You can't run 52 tournaments. So really reduce that to more like 12 that are really like the most important ones. So it's hard as an entrepreneur, if you want to run this event and you want to be the next big thing, I think that's kind of what Shine is experiencing right now, right? Like their first event was 2016. Meanwhile, there are already all these legacy events like Genesis, like the big house, like Evo that have been going for so many years. But I think the reason that Shine sticks out is that it has done super well even though they've lost money it's grown at like a really good pace you know just for two events they've been here on the game here is why shine is unique over everything i'm gonna ask you some questions first of all can anyone name me what the event the attendance rate for genesis one was number of people who showed up uh it was under 500 i believe for both games combined right melee singles was about 250 entrance ballpark right all right. Um, first Evo, how much was it? Evo 2013, oh, th even. Oh, oh, for Smash, for Smash. Um, for Melee, yeah. Yeah, I think that was about four or 500. I, I know where you're going with this, though, and I totally... 700, I totally 700, that was Evo, right? Yeah. 700. Anyways, and you can do this for Big House. You can do right. this for all these events. CEO, Shine's first event. No one had even heard of Shine. 900 plus entrance if yeah. i'm yeah. correct i'm not, I'm, I'm gonna try to not talk on my ass but i'm looking it up right now shine shine 2016 melee entrance and yeah. to me that is something it's a phenomenon no one has ever come close to having that many entrance that much just straight up like hype for one event regard 989 they were 11 yeah. like from a thousand wow. right it's the killer all... branding man just look like literally the apparel the logo the name of the tournament the guy's name is she you know like <laughs> -E, you know it's it all yeah. ties together so well and then you, like, look, you look at the results right like these these mango hungry box scrubs get third and fourth place music King wins the whole tournament s fat second some crazy upsets you know uh people love the event they loved like this the the storylines that were in it too and a lot of just really cool things came from it, right? Like, everyone knows Gommel now. Why? Because Leffen's run in 2016. Now everyone knows, and 2017. Everyone knows Gommel now because of those legacies that happened there. And Shine has its own storylines, too. And we're sort of seeing this case now where the people who won events last year are now defending their throne. You know what I mean? Like, like Armada defending Summit, or me defending Smash and Splash, or Leffen defending Gommel. Like, people start to have their name associated with these events. And that's really, really cool, because they go in as the champs, Mm -hmm. And and but Shine doesn't have that. Shine has like a variety of just who knows what's gonna happen at it. And I'm just hoping that he does the right decisions and he really takes advantage of the legacy that he built on Shine, uh, just to make a good event three. And I'm actually gonna I'm gonna check really quick how much did he have Shine 2017. If he had it was a lot. a lot. Was it was it was it less than last year? No, it was absolutely more. Shine uh, Smash Four had like 650 alone. Eleven. And, wow. Fifty six. Yeah. One of the biggest it, events of the entire year. That's, That's what we call an instant classic. Like when you debut with almost a thousand people, <laughs> instant classic. Instant classic. Instant classic. It is. I mean, that's that's you can't you can't ignore that. And they had early venue fifty, venue sixty, late venue eighty. Thought should you just put venue eighty full and venue eighty, late venue one hundred? To and do you think people will still go if that's the case? That's rough, man. Because you know, big house. I think they experienced some growing pains, or not even growing pains. Just they increased the venue fee, and there were people. In the Smash Four community, that just flat out uh, from Michigan just didn't want to attend the event, just straight up, you know, almost, almost boycotted um, the event in that case. So, but then melee players fifteen hundred, it was the biggest right, yeah, right, yeah, like, like by far. It it is honestly, you know, if you if you aren't getting sponsorship for your event, um, that's the most straightforward way to sort of recoup your losses. But I don't know if increasing. Um, the cost to attend the event is the right way to go about it. Sure. Uh, I, I think increasing the amount of things that you provide at the event so that you can justify an increase in cost is the bigger thing. Because I, I don't think people um, in Michigan, you know, were necessarily off track being upset with the increase in price because realistically, Big House delivered, you know, the same experience compared to last year. Like it was it was the same thing, which is awesome. Like Big House always runs on time, <clears throat> always has tons of setups. But if you're someone that sort of wants to put your dollars into events that are offering more than just the standard open tournament bracket, I can kind of see that mindset. Um, but I still think if you're from Michigan and didn't support Big House, like you're you're in the loony bin, like straight up. Like that's that's your scenes event. Like Big House is Michigan. 
Um, so I, I don't necessarily agree with people not supporting it in that regard, but I do understand being upset with a price increase. Um, but yeah, if, if I were in Xi's case, you know, that's, that's honestly really rough. Um, because he he had Geico as a as a major sponsor, and if he's still losing that much money, uh, I I think HBox, you're spot on. Maybe moving into a different venue it could have uh, hurt w- would be the the best case because he you know, still get the numbers. Yeah, the the venue's in an awesome location. It's it's absolutely stunning, but you know the hotels around it are really expensive. Right, the food around it's really expensive. It's so, Boston, like, if, man. It's yeah, Boston. like if yeah. if you're trying to cater more towards the gamer crowd it might make sense to move into something that's you know easier on their wallets and easier on yours um as a tournament organizer myself i totally get where he's coming from because you want to you know you want to make the tournament better year to year so going from such a prestigious venue like that one into something that's you know not as hype not as good i could see where um you know he he wouldn't want to move in that direction because you know i i respect that you know, with Shine especially, they put so much emphasis on the player experience. Like, there's so much to do. Um, even if you're someone that goes O2, there's the lane shift brackets, um, so much stuff um, that I I wish them nothing but success. And you know, Matt, we, who we had on last last uh, week, he's such a good guy, such an awesome TO. So um, yeah, I'm I'm confident that those guys know what they're doing. They have more than enough experience uh, to write the ship. So I'm I'm hopeful. That next year's event will be uh, financially sustainable um, for she because th- their team deserves it and they definitely are putting a lot of work in. 100%. For sure, yeah, and I mean, like Northeast is is a great market. It is an expensive market in general in terms of real estate, commute, hotel, anything. So you know that there's that barrier to overcome as opposed to something in the Midwest, for instance, which would generally real estate wise be cheaper maybe more options you know people used to right. driving everywhere but if you're going to be in boston you want to accommodate people who just take a train up from new york or you know down from wherever so we'll see i guess that's that's a next year sort of thing but uh super excited about you know to see see what happens because i know there's other things brewing and it may even justify you know staying there who knows we'll see i guess um for now though do you feel like there's any other points of oversaturation uh in the market or we good to like kind of like move on to our next uh, qualifiers. Uh, I'm good to move on. I don't know if you guys have any closing thoughts on this topic. I'm good. I'm gooch. It's like all it's all been well said so far. Yeah, pretty much. I think we got a lot to like sit on and think about, and I'm sure that you know constructive criticism to the community is always acceptable and appreciated. So let's talk about tri-state. So I'm going to be seeing you there, Max. Uh, I'm super excited for this one too. Uh, I know hey. I, get, I get very I get very excited for everything, but it is true. I am excited for this one in particular. We are going to be at next level on Saturday, and uh, as you all know, that's like a, a very uh, good area for fighting games in general. If you've ever watched their stream, if you aren't in the area, I'm sure you've seen mm-hmm. their streams. Um, so, how about you tell us a little bit about your experience of the past at next level and what you think Tri State Area is going to bring for the. Uh, CSL Smash experience. For sure. I'm actually headed there uh, as soon as we wrap up this show for the Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite Weekly. And I was there last week as well. And my friend Dakota, the Rapture, and I, we run a monthly Smash 4 tournament out of there called Smash Attack as well. So next level, Teresa, as you would know, uh, it's kind of the spiritual successor to Chinatown Fair Arcade in Manhattan. Uh, This venue is, of course, in Brooklyn. But basically, once Chinatown Fair uh, shut down... There was a great need in the New York City fighting game community for another venue. And Henry Sen, a longtime Street Fighter player, undertook the responsibility. And he opened up Next Level as his own property. Um, So Henry is still running it. He's got a good team over there and stuff. They've been running Street Fighter, Marvel, Injustice, Mortal Kombat, Tekken, etc. Basically all all the popular fighting games. Um, And then when Dakota and I got involved, they started adding Smash 4 as well. So that's where our event is going to be on Saturday. It's a very historic uh, piece of fighting game history. I, I know that's a. No, but it, it's legit. No, but it's yes. legit. It's yeah, legit. Everybody. I mean, having grown up in New York, you know, this is like exciting for me because we are a fighting game city, so to speak. This is, you know, mm-hmm. it was hilarious when StarCraft Two came out, and that was my big thing. Like, it was such a small scene in comparison to any other fighting game event that was happening. And I used to laugh. I'm like, well, you're in, you know, you're in fighting game territory. You know, you're a little, uh, you're a little 
RTS isn't going to fare as well. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it makes a lot of sense, too, if you think of, like, the New Yorker attitude and stereotypes and stuff. Like, that's <laughs> true. So, it's I all love very much... In front of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so embodied by the FGC. You know, we're, like, a tough-talking, no BS kind of community, and that's really, like, how the average New Yorker is. And this is, like, really where fighting games grew up. I'd say uh, Southern California and New York City were really where the traditional fighting game community uh, had its roots. So mm -hmm. it's definitely exciting to be a next level. For me, it's kind of like, you know, it was Tuesday for me because uh, I, I go there all the time. It's local to me. But I know that this is like a spot that a lot of people watch. You know, they watch Spooky Stream every Wednesday or whatever, and they're like, wow, I wish I could get to go out to this. So it definitely is an honor and a privilege to be able to run an event there. Uh, I will be the head TO myself as well as Dakota backing me up. Uh, again, my co-host for the Smash Attack monkeys there. Uh, we're looking at definitely a very strong turnout for Smash 4. As uh, you know, as one of the founders of Smash 4 Collegiate, we've had typically very strong uh, home regions. So Toronto or Ontario South and Tri-State. This has been good for us. So we're definitely going to have a solid amount of teams. I'm hoping the Melee crowd can match it as well. Uh, you know, we're throughout the week just pushing out all the promotion and trying to get as many eyes on it as possible. Tri-State also was originally a big part of TMG as well when it was first just like a New England versus um, Mid-Atlantic kind of league. So, yeah, um, we have the former national champions from 2016, Rutgers University. They're coming with kind of a, a gimped squad as many of their best players have graduated. Particularly Typical collegiate problem, by the yes. way. <laughs> <laughs> particularly False, who was their anchor um, and a very good friend of myself and Joe as well. He uh, is now an alumni, so he won't be able to participate. And also, um, another one of their extremely strong players, Shoyo James, is part of the Newark campus, whereas the rest of the team is New Brunswick. So under CSL's mm -hmm. rules, they're unallowed or yep. they're disallowed from competing together. So um, yeah, Rutgers is definitely not like the extremely threatening beast that they were in 2016, but they're still definitely solid. They have a, a solid lineup uh, zone, their captain is very good and i actually believe he's an alumni as well so he'll just be there as moral support and coach but still a solid team to look out for and yeah uh, nyu has typically performed very well they're going to be there as well but again their anchor nick c the captain falcon is not going to be present so it, it's a very interesting time in tri-state yeah. collegiate smash because all of the legends are kind of out of the picture now and it, it's really up for grabs so i'm looking forward to see what all these new players can do um and then, of course, on the other side of things, on Sunday, we're going to the Atlantic South Empire in Columbia, South Carolina. So uh, Atlantic South has typically been strong for Melee. Georgia teams have made it very far in previous TMG seasons. But again, that all changes when the players graduate, right? So I feel like it's going to be a big-time question mark in both regions this time. You got a clean the slate, is what yeah. you're saying. <laughs> clean so, slate, both sides. Yes. Um, also, UGA... One, uh, took home third place in national finals at Shine 2017 this year in Smash 4. But again, a lot of their players graduated. So I actually don't think they have a team at all this time. Um, they couldn't get together five players confident enough to make the trip up to Columbia. So uh, they'll be sorely missed. But still, um, again, it's really exciting because we don't know what's going to go on. Right? It was the same thing with Texas where the TO was telling us, like, I didn't know what to think. And then it, it ended up being a very high level of play overall. So Look forward to it. Uh, check out the stream, of course. Uh, Twitch.tv slash C Star League on Saturday and Sunday. There's going to be plenty of action. We'll be there. All right, guys. Well, I feel like we had a big discussion today. This was uh, a lot of good stuff. Again, and each week the show's getting better and better. But, you know, for anybody watching, if you have anything you'd like us to talk about, please hit us up. Uh, C Star League on Twitter or, or any of us individually will be glad to, like, field questions or topics. You know, this is this is what we're here for. But uh, we'll be seeing you, I'm sure, on Saturday, either in New York or down south. So, um, you know, stay in touch, and Smash Course will be back next week. Thanks, guys. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Peace.